Bill dealt severe blows on quizzes and tests with series of constants. Last time we talked about series involving functions, and that's really what it's about for this course. For example, last time we discussed something called a power series. Well, it's named power series because it represents powers of x. And really what I look at it as, which I don't think is such a bad idea, is something like an infinite polynomial. Of course, there is no such thing, that's why I put it in quotes. But just like infinite series of constants is a, a, what we say, a, an extrapolation of the idea of summation, we extend the notion of a polynomial to something like a power series. And we'll find out why here in a second. Now, last time, what we found was that if you take a real number line and figure out where that number C is, Then there was something called a radius of convergence associated with the power series, call it R. And what's interesting about R is that if you go R units this way and R units this way, Then you have what's called the interval of convergence, and the series converges absolutely inside the interval, strictly inside the interval. The series converges absolutely. So if you pick a number right here, x, whatever it may be, and put that x into your series, then you have a series of constants, because everything's fixed now, and that series converges absolutely, which is the best kind of convergence. We talked about that a few days ago, too. And what we learned was that the series diverges outside the interval. And at the endpoints, you don't know. So really what your problems came down to were these three things. Determine R, which pretty much tells you the whole story and then check the remaining gaps in the story, namely the endpoints. Now, this, for your book, is pretty much always a ratio test. We did a couple of problems like that last time. You take the power series, apply the ratio test to it, and when the limit is less than 1, you can figure out what the value of x would be. These endpoints are pretty much like all the previous problems you had. In other words, you take that specific number, put it into your power series, you've got a series of constants, now does that series of constants converge or not? So that's when you use your integral tests, your uh, alternating series tests, etc. Okay, the big question is, where does the series converge? Well, there are infinitely many things to check, but this stuff down here says, really, you only have to check the endpoints of your interval once you've figured out what the interval is. Okay, now, that's basically a review from last time. The reason I reviewed that is that the following is true. A power series defines a function inside its interval of convergence. You see, inside the interval, the power series converges. You plug an x in. You know, it's the old black box. You heard this from me more than you wish, I hope, suppose. You plug your x into your power series, and out comes a value. And I'll call that f of x. So x's into the power series give you numbers back. That's the functional relationship. Now this, I'm going to put this on hold. And you say, well, this is the last day of class. How long are we going to hold? Oh, not too long, about a semester. 
differential equations you people will be taking power series assuming there are solutions to certain problems plug them in and figure out which power series really are the solutions that in a nutshell is what you'll be doing so back in let's say grammar school you had these equations with x and you figured out what x was what you'll do in differential equations and say well the answer is a power series let me figure out what these a's are and that's a very big tool in that particular area okay what are we doing in this class as promised although I almost missed it here on the last day we're going to get back to your Taylor formula okay you were given an F to get F represented by an nth degree Taylor polynomial plus whatever other garbage is left over that's called your Taylor remainder okay that was an old problem in fact you just had one on a test like that take a function compute some derivatives and from that you can simply plug in the formulas they're in your tables book in fact if you missed it plug in the formulas you get your Taylor polynomial and your remainder now if for some x the remainder goes to zero as n goes to infinity okay well just think about it if this thing goes to zero and this equality is true then this polynomial has to converge to f of x the remainder goes to zero so the polynomial must go to f of x so here's the key thing if you take one of your Taylor formula representations and can show for various x's that the remainder goes to zero then for those x's the polynomials legitimate polynomials now nth degree polynomials in the limit will equal your, equal your function okay we write then if that's the case f of x is the limit as n goes to infinity of p sub n of x but that's uh, that's not so good it doesn't really give you the flavor of what's going on I think of course what's happening here is this should kind of remind you of something we've been doing now for a couple of weeks taking partial sums of constants we're, we're not doing that we're taking partial sums of monomials in effect and so this gave us the idea of infinite series again that's what happens here we'll use notation f of x is the infinite series of these monomials now I shouldn't have to remind you because this just happened a couple of days ago in this class when you took your test your Taylor polynomial was constructed with these coefficients you took the nth derivative at a divided by n factorial x minus a to the nth power okay that if you stopped at some point would be the Taylor polynomial if the remainder goes to zero then in the limit you get f of x equal to this thing over here Now, what is this thing of course it's a power series here's your a sub n there's your c so what I'm saying is functions may look like polynomials which seems to be an awfully wishy-washy statement I mean uh, if you're expecting highbrow mathematics that's not what you expect I think but mathematicians don't think as unusually as you might guess I mean, behind a lot of the ideas are these intuitions and thoughts and feelings and hopes and wishes etc and of course all of its expressed symbolically but the ideas still are pretty general and that's the big one functions look like polynomials let's see why you might want to use that give you an example from way back let's drag you back uh, gee, almost a year calc 1 calc 2 you're making that uh, transition at some point in calc 2 your teacher might have gone to the board and said well let's integrate this thing 
and he would have st stood back, and maybe one of you would have been sharp enough, but I hope the teacher was at least, to say, oh, sorry, we can't do that one. Let me fix it up so we can. And perhaps he'd slip in an x, in which case you'd let u be x squared, du is 2x dx, and you go on your merry way. But uh, if you did that, you know, after a while, the teacher keeps making up these problems that just work. You know, if you change it a little bit, it won't work. You start wondering, well, out there in the real world, do they always work? And the answer is no. You know, you might go over to your aerospace lab and the prof says, well, to solve the problem, we're going to have to find this integral. And then you slap your head and say, well, hey, Chamberlain never taught me that one. What gives here? Well, that's because you're thinking back Calc 1, Calc 2. Chamberlain will show you how to do this one. In fact, you can do a whole lot of them this way. Now, what is about the simplest thing to integrate? I'll answer that question. Right over here. Simplest thing to integrate are polynomials. Integral of x to the n is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, as long as n is positive. And that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to say that cosine function right there looks like a polynomial, because then I could integrate it and I'd be done. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Now, we don't have time to show you all the various relationships of functions to their so-called polynomials. By the way, these are called Taylor series. In other words, the Taylor polynomials in the limit become the Taylor series if the Taylor remainder goes to zero, okay? So what I need to do is figure out what, uh, what series I should use here. This is where your little tables book, again, comes in handy. In fact, very handy at this point. If you look on the first page, it turns out that a lot of the drudgery has been done for you. Cosine x equals 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial, let's see if I got it right here, yep, plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial, minus x to the 6th over 6 factorial, etc. You can see the pattern. It's written down explicitly as well. Alternating signs, even powers of x, same factorial and denominator. Pretty easy to remember, but you don't even have to do that. It's here in the book. Now, let's see here. It says over here, okay, this is what you could have done a couple of weeks ago, gotten the, let's say, fourth degree Taylor polynomial, polynomial. And if that were the case, if I asked for the fourth degree Taylor polynomial, you would have stopped right there. There it is. And you would have had a remainder, which you would express somehow. Turns out that someone, you can look in your book, probably do it there, shows the remainder goes to zero for all x. For every x, the remainder will go to zero. That means the Taylor polynomials always converge to the cosine. And that's why in the book here it says, basically, this is true for all x. That series converges to the cosine for all x. Well, that's what's in the book. Now, how do you use it? That's all I ask you to be able to do. Well, I need to integrate cosine x squared. Now, all I've got is cosine x. I hope I can stop some people before they get started off in the wrong direction. I'm not asking you to say, okay, now I've got cosine x squared. Now I've got to go find the Taylor formula. Ooh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go through that again. Well, you don't have to do it again. Anybody know the short, slick, easy way to do this? What? That's kind of the right idea. Change the x squared. What I really want to do is change the x here to x squared. I mean, you can slap anything in for the argument. x squared's good enough. So what I'll have is x squared squared, x squared to the fourth, x squared to the sixth. For all x squared, well, that's still all x. So the first thing you ought to realize is that these formulas can be expanded into other shapes and forms. Let me just give you another idea. What if uh, in here I had square root of x times cosine x squared? I mean, that's terrible. That's, that's worse, but I could do the same thing. I can multiply all the way through by square root of x. Well, what's the final result? Looks like a polynomial. You know, I'm as lazy as anybody. I don't want to have to go out of my way to evaluate certain things, and so, I make my function look like a polynomial. 
Now, what's true about a polynomial? The integral of the terms of the polynomial is the sum of the integrals of the terms, which is still true here. Another theorem says that I can integrate this thing term by term. Let's see what I'm integrating. 1 minus x to the fourth over 2 factorial plus x to the eighth over 4 factorial. Got one more here. That's x to the twelfth over 6 factorial, etc. I'm not writing in the the nth term, that's better, but let's just get the, f the feeling of what's happening. So there I have it. My cosine of x squared is now a polynomial, infinite. And ag there, again, there's another theorem in the book that says if you have an integral of a power series inside its interval of convergence, you can integrate term by term. So I'll have x minus x to the fifth over 10 plus x to the 9 over Let's see, what do we have here? 24, <coughs> 9. You see, that's what's nice about polynomials. You can always do all this by hand if you had to. 216. I don't know if I can do the next one by hand, so I'll, I'll leave it. But it is just integer multiplication at this point. Oops, far, sorry, not the x. I've just integrated, so now I've got to stick in my limits of integration. 0, 1. And that's easy. That's 1 minus a tenth plus a 2 sixteenth minus dot, dot, dot. And so that is the answer. If you need that in your aerospace lab, there's the answer. <coughs> well, one of you s shakes his head in satisfaction. Some of you, I think, would say, uh, that's not an answer. I mean, it's an infinite series. Uh, you know, I've got to go to a computer or something to figure out what that number is. I don't want to have to do that. Well, I could say with a programmable calculator, I think you could pretty safely start summing terms. But uh, let's just talk about philosophy now. What you're really saying is I don't want to get close to infinite series. You know, everything I've done in the old days was uh, take an antiderivative and plug in the numbers and use my calculator. And that's where I stop and say, look, when you get an antiderivative which has cosine in it or exponential function or whatever and you start evaluating that antiderivative with the limits of integration what are you doing? You use an infinite series or something equivalent to it. Now, don't forget your calculator only does addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. In other words, as far as your calculator is concerned, functions look like polynomials. So all you're doing is hiding it. When you say, let's find an antiderivative and evaluate it using a calculator, I'm saying, why find the antiderivative? Why not go directly to the answer and basically use your calculator to figure it out? Okay. So answers may be infinite series, and that may not be a bad form. Certainly, we've saved ourselves a lot of effort trying to figure out what the antiderivative of cosine x squared is if it exists even. We're not even sure it does. Well, let me not finish that. If we agree philosophically that that's not such a bad answer, then we ought to come to grips with the practical question of, well, I need a decimal for my prof. How many terms should I go in order to get my answer? If I need, let's say, uh, two degree accuracy, how far do I have to go? Well, for example, your last computer program was along these lines. When you evaluated the p series with p equal 2, that was the 1 over n squared that you summed up, and you looked at the various terms, sums, for very large values of n, after a while you saw the same number coming up on the computer, which suggests, and it's correct, that the only differences in the sums are out there in the 8th, 9th, 10 decimal places or further out. So what you're looking at, if it doesn't change from the computer, is about as accurate as you want, probably. It's, uh, it would be scary if that weren't the case. So that would be one practical answer. Have your computer start adding these terms, and when the numbers start looking the same, that means probably all the errors are out there where you don't care. 
But there's a better answer, actually. By the alternating series test, I really call it a corollary. What we learned in class was, for example, with this alternating series, knowing that it does converge, if you stop at a certain point, the sum that you have differs from the big sum, the one you're after, by no more than the next term in the series. So to make that concrete, the thing that my series converges to, just as an example, differs from, let's say, the first two terms. by no more than the absolute value of the next term, 1 over 216. Okay, I hope what I've written there makes good sense and that you can uh, apply it to more practical situations where you would want, uh, obviously, more accuracy than 1 200th. That's about all I've guaranteed here. So you still don't have second decimal accuracy but if you continue on, you'll find that these numbers, of course, going to zero forces that accuracy. And the number of terms you take here, you can check, gives you a certain accuracy associated with the next term right there. So in other words, you can write your computer program to add terms until the next term is as little as you wish for accuracy. And then that sum that you have is it. Now, I must emphasize that this is only the case for alternating series. No fair taking a positive series and saying, well, stop here. The sum I have is accurate to the next term. That's not the case. Let me give you a quick example. For example, the harmonic series. If you stop at the millionth term, well, then the next term is less than a millionth. That does not mean that you are within a millionth of the sum, because the sum happens to be plus infinity. You're never going to be within a millionth of that. Okay, so what fails here is that it does not alternate in sign. If your answer does alternate in sign, you're in great shape. You've got a lot of discussion in your book. I'm going to run a couple of uh, problems quickly by you. I think these two are, well, in fact, I think this was one of your homework problems or one like it. Let me give you another one now. In probability and statistics, which I like, so that's why you're getting one of these. In probs and stats, it turns out one needs a sum that looks like this. I'll kind of make it up here. Uh, let's say n times 3 fifths to the nth. I need to find out what that sum is when I'm computing what's called the mean of a distribution, a geometric distribution. Now, this is not so obvious, but let me show you where the stuff I've come up with is very helpful. Again, in your book, by the way, this is called the geometric distribution. This is called the geometric series. You might suspect some relationship. In your book, you'll find this entry. I think it's on page two at the top, somewhere around there anyway. Now, this isn't true for all x. This is only for x between minus and plus 1. You see, not always does the remainder go to zero. Not always does the function f of x, in this case 1 over 1 minus x, equal its, in this case, Maclaurin series. It doesn't e equal except in this interval right here. So unlike the cosine and the sine and the exponential, where all x worked, this only works in this interval. OK. What good is it? I'm always suspicious but it never happens that some student will say, well, sir, why are you taking such a very simple function like this and making it such a hard-looking function like that over there? I mean, this is just simple division, subtraction and division. And we're talking infinite series over here. That's child's play. That's calc 3. Why are we doing it? Well, here's the reason. I said you can integrate term by term. You can also differentiate term by term. Take the derivative of both sides. There are some details you have to worry about, but let's not worry about them. Let's see, this will be, I think, 1 over 
1 minus x quantity squared. You take the derivative there. And the right-hand side, you get 0 plus 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared, etc. Again, uh, I don't think you see the light at the end of the tunnel quite yet, but here it comes. I'm going to multiply through by x. And what you're looking at right there, if you don't spot it, is roughly what you're looking at up here with x equal 3 fifths. It's 3 fifths plus 2 3 fifths squared plus 3 3 fifths cubed, etc. So this thing, by this equality right here, would be 3 fifths divided by 1 minus 3 fifths squared. So what looked like a pretty tough series, I hope you realize it wasn't geometric to start with. That's the geometric series. But it being related to a geometric series, you can get by taking derivatives what you're after. So integrals and derivatives, you can play around with them and get some fantastic results, really. It's surprising how much you can do with series. It's a very big topic. And it's too bad we only have what time we do have. But uh, at this point, the applications go off and umpteen different directions. It's very tough to actually take a course in mathematics from this point on that doesn't have series in one form or another. A very natural topic. Okay, I, I didn't do a, a complete job by any means on the last two sections in your book. I just kind of skipped over the details today. I hope by seeing the framework, just seeing kind of what's going on, you can appreciate the examples in the book. There are several. By all means, read through them. You're going to see something like what I've done here today. And uh, take a look at your homework problems. For example, let's get you started on one of them. This is also from Probs and Stats. If you talk about grading on the curve, it seems to be everybody's favorite topic this time of year. Well, the curve in question is this fantastic bell shape. And that is almost the function that you need for the bell shape curve. And if you're computing a probability, that would be the thing that would be staring you in the face. Again, your Calc 2 prof would never give you that problem because there is no antiderivative, no simple antiderivative for e to the minus x squared. But there is the famous formula, which you may now recognize because that also was one of your computer programs. Here's Taylor polynomial. And again, for all x, it converges to the exponential. So this actually is an infinite series representation Again, for all x for the exponential. We play the same trick that we did with a cosine. Namely, if I want e to the minus x squared, well, just go ahead and do it. Stick in x squared everywhere. 1 minus x squared plus x squared squared over 2 factorial minus x squared cubed over 3 factorial, etc. That's where I'm going to stop because, after all, it is your homework problem, not mine. But there's your infinite polynomial, easy to compute. You'll have an alternating series. It says, well, we want, uh, was it, three or four decimal accuracy. You start looking at the terms until you get something that's less than 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4, whatever it is. As soon as that term is that small, then the sum you've got by alternating series is that close to the answer that you're after. It's real quick. That's what's fantastic. There's a lot of power going on here. And what used to be Impossible, absolutely impossible integrals. Now, it need not be uh, definite, by the way. I can get indefinite integrals. You don't have to plug things in. You can do it that way. You can get some real power by just looking at everything as if it were a polynomial. Most of the time, it works. OK, most of the time. Don't forget little hang-ups like this. Functions aren't always equal to their series. Well, I think that's it. I hope you uh, at least appreciate power series, understand it a bit, and ultimately use it. Goodbye.